I firmly believe you need a purpose in, in getting up in the morning. Um, I think, you know, after age 65, the purpose changes a little bit so that, um, you know, if you can get up and put your feet on the ground, that's a major accomplishment already, so. So you have to find things that inspire you. Exactly. In 2011, the New York Times named Alvin Wong as the happiest person in America. This assertion was based on the results of a poll that created a profile of the attributes that contribute to a good life. They were not expecting to find someone with all these qualities, but all it took was a few phone calls. Alvin Wong, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In 2011, Gallup conducted a three-year poll to create a statistical composite of the happiest person in America. They found that the person would be male, tall, Asian American, live in Hawaii at least 65 years old, married with children, have his own business, and be an observant Jew. When a New York Times reporter set out to find this person, she called a synagogue in Hawaii and was told that not only does this person exist, but his name is Alvin Wong. Alvin Wong, or Al as he prefers to be called, was born and raised in Honolulu and considers himself to be a very happy man. Is it because he has all the attributes listed in the poll? Or are there other reasons that he considers himself so happy? I was born in 1941, about maybe six months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Earliest memories is we had a bomb shelter in our backyard. I lived uh, in the Bingham Track, McCulley area. We had a bomb shelter, which was a hole dug in the ground and some sandbags put up. But I remember playing army in these, these, these trenches. And Did you keep like it that. for many years after the war? Yeah. And I wouldn't let my dad take it down because it was nice. But then my dad says, huh, there's this big hole in the backyard. It's, it's a liability. So he took it down after a while. But I remember when I was four or five, I would, I would be playing in there and doing things like that. But, um, uh, you know, and uh, um, fond memories of, of childhood where you walked everywhere, you know. and. Uh, and let's see, you were in the Bingham Tract area, so yeah. where could you walk to that was fun as a kid? Well, we had a soda fountain down the street. That was fun. You go and have ice cream and stuff like that. Was that the that? old John Ng store? Yeah. How do oh, you know I, that? I love that little grocery store where he had sh yeah. shave ice yes. and candy and right. juice wax candy. <laughs> well, you bit off the thing and you, yeah. Where did you play? Around the neighborhood. We used to play football in the street, which is amazing because Nowadays, you play in the street, that's a death wish. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't do it now. But in those days, there weren't very many cars. Why am I dating myself? <laughs> we had a three-bedroom house with a one bathroom. And, uh, you know, my earliest memories is uh, 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 some of my dad's siblings would stay with us. So there would be maybe five or six, seven people in the house at one time, all using the same bathroom. Nowadays, you know, you think about it and you say, how is that possible? But we managed when this, this happiness thing came around. So I, I started thinking about why would I be so happy? Why am I so happy? And, and you know, I had to think back on my youth. Um, the kinds of things that my parents taught me, you know, uh, growing up, we, we were very, uh, we were taught to be humble. You know, the Asian way, you know. Were you taught by words or by example? Both. Example, yes, definitely. Uh, my father was the most humble person out, you know. And um, in fact, he, you know, one of his mantras was, if you're going to succeed in a Western culture, you have to drop all your Asian beliefs and adopt the, Asi uh, the Western culture. Now, was he an immigrant? No, he wasn't. He was born here. But he had this firm belief that you couldn't succeed until you became a Westerner or, you know, of, of, of the beliefs of, of what the, the Western culture was about. Mm. So when you think about it, you know, it's, um, I think it's really profound to say 
you can't just keep all your Asian beliefs and, and make other people um, you know, believe in this kind of thing. You have to either meet them halfway or you have to go and meet them on their grounds. I see. Yeah. So, so humility, he was very humble. And, and I think he taught us that very well in terms of, you know, he would always say, you're not the most important person. You're not the smartest person. That, now, today people would say, well, that's, that's not giving you self-esteem, El. Uh, but introspectively, if you look at it, I don't think anybody can call themselves the smartest person. There's always somebody smarter. There's always somebody who knows something maybe different than what you know, and you can always learn from them. So, yes, um, in, in this kind of culture that we live in today, self-esteem plays a big part. But when you think about it, when you really think about it, if you're humble and you really believe that you're not the most important person, but you can learn from everybody else, that I think encourages your self-esteem to say, I want to learn more. Yeah, you, I think your dad was giving you perspective. I mean, to, to put, place you in context, yes. which is really helpful in the world. Right, right, definitely, definitely. Um, and that's the example that he, that he led. And my mom, you know, my mom was a ho homemaker. So I think if you look at today's standards, she probably had about a fourth grade education. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet her job, which she did very well, was to keep the family together, to keep the family clean, to keep the family looking nice, and to guide us, the kids, in the right direction. Do you remember any advice she gave you? The one thing that, that she always told me, and this was when I was young, and as I was getting older in life and trying to make a decision, what do I want to do? Uh, she said, whatever you do, you can do anything you want, but you gotta be happy at what you do. You have to, when you get up in the morning and you're going to work, you have to make sure that you're happy. And if you're not happy, then you got to do something about that. Do you remember uh, being told you were a happy kid or feeling that you were happy as a kid? Um, no, not in that terminology. Um, but I, I think my, my mother was more introspective with this kind of stuff. And she paid attention to demeanor. She paid attention to personalities. And when she saw that maybe I was in a funk, she would say, why, why aren't you happy? Or why aren't you, you know, what's wrong? And, um, and, and, you know, I mean, as a kid, you would say, wow, how did you know that I was, you know, feeling bad about something? And, and we would talk about it. And, you know, I mean, this lady with a fourth grade education was probably heads up over a lot of people in terms of, um, you know, looking at oneself, looking at how you, how you, portray life, how do you go through life and make it through life. Right, priorities and... Exactly. And, and, and yeah, priorities and, and also attention. Right. Alvin Wong's father had a career as the financial vice president of the old Honolulu Star Bulletin. He believed in the importance of education and made sure that his children went to good schools. You went to a private school. I did. So your dad definitely paid for your education. We, we, we you know, he, he was very much aware that education was was foremost in terms of um, you know anything else that he could give us in life and uh, he took a special interest in, in how we were doing in school what we were learning and things like that and um, you know being the CFO he stressed math he didn't stress as much science because that was that wasn't the area that he was in um, but he stressed math yeah. Now, why did your parents decide to send you to Marinol? <laughs> um, it, was, it wasn't a, a, a decision based on, well, this was the best school and they did research on it. It was the closest school to where I lived. <laughs> but it's a co-ed it Catholic school with yeah. a good rep? It was. And, I mean, they, they couldn't have do, done any worse, you know, in terms of, of that. But... Um, uh, it was close. It was walking distance. I walked to school, walked home, and it was a private school. So, you know, and strangely enough, my sisters 
um, did their high school education at Roosevelt Public School, but my dad insisted that my brother and I stay at the private school. Um, right. Now, it seems to me that Roosevelt, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't that an English standard yes. school? So that was a tough school to for get local into. kids to get into. Yes, exactly. You had to speak standard right. English. Yes, that's right. So that wasn't a slam dunk. No, but yes, that was the first English standard school in Honolulu. And your sisters made it in there? Yep. Did your sisters mind that the boys got to go to private school and they didn't? Well, I think my, my other sister, Alana, who, who recently passed away, um, would tell me, well, we, we had a choice, but we wanted to go to the English Standard School. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Alana wanted to be a journalist. She ended up as being one of the first women on the Hawaii Bar. Um, and uh, this was in 1949 where there were like maybe two other women in, in the Hawaii bar at that time. That's wonderful. So, you know, I mean, when, when I look at my family, they, they sort of pioneered um, and, and created this, this path that others can take. You know, she was a woman, she was Asian, and, you know, she, she was admitted to the Hawaii bar. So you went to Marinol, mm -hmm. and then, then what did you do? Um, then I attended University of Hawaii for a while, and then I went to the mainland for school. Um, and uh, over in the East Coast, Boston University. Um, and uh, came back and did some postgraduate work at Oregon State. I was in the sciences because my dad was kind of leading, leading me in that direction of, of being a professional, and, you know, maybe a physician. Um, and, and I thought, well, you know, I mean, I, I was very much interested in, in financial aspects of things, you know, being Chinese and everything. <laughs> and your dad was also. Exactly. But he wanted you to go to science, whereas he went into the numbers. Yeah. Well, and, and yes, that's true. Um, and I never did ask him, why did you do that? Um, the, the one hint I get was he wanted us to be professionals so that we didn't have to work for someone because he had worked for someone for all of these years and he was saying this is hard work to work for somebody you need to be on your own but you know in this day and age it's like working alone now is is even challenging so but um, you know again i i went i went with the numbers and and, and, and towards the end, I kept telling him, you know, I mean, I'm blaming you for this. You, you, you were the role model of this thing. He didn't say anything. He didn't say. <laughs> now, did he and your mom expect you to marry a nice Chinese girl? Well, if they did, they're seriously disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think... Um, they never told you anything no. one way or the other. Uh, but, you know, I mean, my mom told me, and my wife Trudy was there, you know, she said... Oh, you know, the, the Jewish culture is one of the oldest cultures in the world. And it's coming from somebody who had, you know, a f fourth grade education, you know, it was profound, you know, to say, oh. And she would say some of the, the um, cultural practices of the Jews and Chinese are very similar. And in our wedding ceremony, we had uh, uh, veil lifting you know ceremony prior to the wedding and my mother would say yeah she did that too in the chinese ceremony so it's like wow so very accepting well how did you meet trudy tell, tell us about your your wife uh, trudy is a flight attendant with united airlines and she was here on uh, temporary duty uh, one summer this was in 1975 i think she's going to kill me that i don't remember these dates <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, it was in 1975, and, and um, uh, I lived at the Ilikai at that time, and um, uh, she was there too, and we met at a party, and the rest is history. I mean, you know, so. So you actually converted to Judaism. Yes, yes. Her family was uh, uh, more conservative, leaning towards some orthodox beliefs, so. Uh, there was no question that I was going to convert. How did that square away with your Catholic training at Marinol? Well, you know, strangely enough, I went to Marinol for 13 years and I never was baptized a Catholic. Um, and 
you know, I, I keep saying that, you know, it's not that I didn't try, I, I, I tried because peer pressure when you go into school is, oh, you know, I want to take communion with the rest of my friends and stuff. Um, but it, it just never happened for, for whatever reason as I look back on it. Did you experience a re religious, a faith conversion with Judaism? Yeah, yes I did. I mean, in terms of when you look at Judaism and its teachings, um, it probably fits better with me. It's, it's, it's like uh, Judaism teaches that your heaven or hell is here, whatever you make of it while you were living. So if you live a bad life, then your hell is going to be that people remember that you were a bad person. So uh, it's, it's easier to, to kind of understand this and, and, and program your life so that this is the reason why you don't want to be bad is because people remember that, you, that you're going to be bad, not that you're going to hell, which is, where is it, you know, that kind of thing. Elvin Wong retired after a career in finance and data processing and hospital administration. He continues to stay involved in health management as a consultant in quality care for seniors. Since being identified as the happiest person in America in the New York Times article, he's taken on another role, one that has almost become a full-time job. Well, let's talk about the happiest person designation. How, how did all this come about? Well, the... Uh... Gallup Poll and Healthways partnered. Healthways International is one of the largest health um, research companies in the world now. And, and they're researching wellness, well-being, what makes people happy and, and, and things like that. It was for three years and they, they were going to show all the data that, that the Gallup people had on well-being, um, wellness, attitudes in the United States and happiness. And so the author of the, this article in the New York Times thought it would be nice if they did a little whimsical article on who would be the happiest person in the United States based on all of this data that they had. So they challenged the Gallup people to come up with this statistical profile on who would be the happiest person. So. Hawaii was the happiest state for these three years going. Males were happier than females, and um, Asian Americans were happier than any other ethnic group in the United States. Um, people over 65 were happier than people under 65. People married people were happier than unmarried people. People with children were happier than people without children. So it went on and on and on. And the kicker was that in the religious area, Jews were happier than other uh, religious groups in America. And so when you pieced it together to have all of this, this thing, uh, Alvin Wong became the happiest person in America. You were the of, only one who fit all of those criteria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how did you find out? Well. First of all, the, the, the Catherine Rampel, the uh, author of this, this article, said, we got to try. She didn't think that there was going to be anybody with, with this, this, all this, this profile. So she called the temple here and talked to Rabbi Shackman at that time. And um, she read all of this profile. And she said, I'm looking for somebody who would meet some of this criteria. And he said, Alvin Wong meets all the criteria. So, so she called me. And, uh, you know, we talked for about an hour. And in talking to Catherine Rampo, if you were to read the article at the end, she said, bef before he said goodbye, he said, is this a practical joke? <laughs> you know, because I didn't know, why would somebody call me to ask me if I was, no, to tell me that I was the happiest man? I mean, you, you never think about that kind of stuff. I, I wouldn't anyway, and the ensuing months, I received hundreds of phone calls from people all over the world, literally all over the world. Yeah, they ask you what the secret to happiness is. Yeah, that, you know, that, that's the, the single most asked question of me. What is your secret? In the beginning, it was like, secret? I don't have any secret to happiness. You know, I get up in the morning and I'm pretty much happy. But then I was thinking, well, 
I think they're looking for more than that. You know, it's like, give me a secret, you know, um, give me the shot of happiness so that I can be happy tomorrow. So I, I, I did research and, and, and I, I call it my search for my happiness. And I spent almost a year just, just researching all this happiness, you know, gross national happiness, uh, all this stuff. What makes people happy? And, um, and finally came up with, well, you know, it really comes from you. You got to be as happy as you want to be. You can't, nobody pours happiness into you. Exactly. And so this you is what I talk about. You get it from about. outside yep. sources. Yep. Yep. But then I talk about humility. I talk about respect. I talk about compassion. Because if you have all of these things, what you, what you have in life is the ingredients for um, making others happy. I have a favorite Chinese proverb that goes, uh, if you want happiness for an hour, you take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, you go fishing. Uh, if you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. But if you want happiness for a lifetime, help someone else. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's what I wanna do now, is, is to, to spread this, 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 this happiness around. Because so many people ask me about this. And when you were told you, you're the guy, did you say, oh, I mean, did you think you were that happy person? You, you never think about that kind of stuff. I, I wouldn't anyway, and you know what I mean? And I guess the other thing that, that I'm really shocked about is that there is such a fuss made about this little article that appeared in the New York Times. You know. It's because it's something everybody wishes for and exactly. wants more of. And that's what I learned is that everybody, it, I mean, after a while it was, I, I began getting so depressed. It's like everybody <laughs> out there is, is, is looking for happiness and they think they can find it by asking somebody else what, what it is, you know. So it's, it's, I tell everybody that, you know, having this, this designation placed on me has, has, is, has been very stressful because everybody expects me to be happy. I don't think anyone expects you to be an automaton. No, no, no. So, uh, but I, you know, I like to think that whatever I do, it's not because of the title, but because it's genuine. So I, I will admit, I get mad at times. Usually I get mad at inanimate objects. I will drop something on the floor and lose it because that was a stupid thing to do but I'm blaming myself for it so I'm losing it because I'm blaming myself for it. What gives you your biggest feeling of security? The family. Knowing, see, and, and, and this is what we stress with the kids growing up, you know, we, we, we have a family core, have dinner together, at least have dinner together and um, the family makes up this security. I've learned in life, and this is maybe through my parents' example, that everything you do, you do well, but you do with passion. In order for you to do it well, you have to be passionate at what you do. And if it's marriage, you have to be passionate at, 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 at the marriage part. If it's raising kids, you have to be passionate about doing that. Um, for me, the, the, the thing that, that drives me in many areas, uh, if I'm going to cook dinner tonight, I'm going to be so passionate about what I'm doing, um, whether it be a stew, whether it be a curry or, or whatever, you know, it's, it's going to be the best. You don't stay up and worry and s steam and fret at night. About anything. Uh, well, I used to. I, I can't say I didn't. Uh, you know, when you're in the workplace and, you know, you, you think that you've reached an impasse on a certain issue or whatever, yeah, you know, you stay awake, you, you worry about it. I mean, I used to do that a lot. Um, but I guess maybe this is why in the Gallup poll it says people over 65 are happier because they're wiser now. They know that they're not going to solve the problem if the brain is so chaotic as, as worrying about things and they're gonna sleep on it and they're gonna... So it's not as frenzied a life anymore, you know. And, and maybe that's why, you know, pe pe older people have a 
a better chance of being happy because their outlook changes a little. Your wife is such a great sport, uh, you know, because I know when you pass, sometimes people say, oh, there's the happiest man in America. Uh, does she give you a hard time about it ever? All the time. <laughs> The Gallup poll identified mostly physical aspects of what makes a happy person. But for Alvin Wong, it has been the intangible qualities of upbringing, humility, compassion, and above all, family that are at the core of his happiness. Mahalo to Alvin Wong for sharing some of his happiness with us, and mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahoi ho! For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Do you make a distinction between happiness and joy, which I've heard people do? Happiness really depends more on circumstances and joy is, is more a, you know, a state of being. Joy is a state of being. Joy is when you get to buy your first BMW. Joy is when you, when you, um, you know, get your first iPad or something like that. Um, but it, it quickly wears off. I see. So happiness and, is an enduring state. Yeah. 